and maybe I will share. I found something that tie the models. I'm gonna share it with share it on yeah. So on this link, uh, yeah. they do uh, tie the models version of ISLR. So yeah. I was trying to use that, but mm -hmm. I was able to come until uh, leave one out cross validation. And then, uh, I mean, it was not, I mean, there are not too many, um, they are not uh, generated the things for uh, leave one out cross validation in tidy models. Then I skipped to the K fold, but the, then uh. I noticed that I forgot what I have done last week. <laughs> so I don't think that I am prepared very well but maybe we can go through um, some part on, maybe I can directly start so I will not take too much time. What do you think? Yeah, 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 that would be great. I think that's fine if you just use ML's like, book because that's the one that I'm using for the tidy models as well. So I didn't get it, I'm sorry. No worries. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. So, um, so I also wrote the link here as well. So we will have tidy models and IS ISLR2 um, okay. package and we will use auto and portfolio data sets. And for validation set, um, we use it to estimate error rates and maybe we will just skip some parts and we use set seats to uh, reproduce our results and for um, Bayesar, we use just sample to split the data into two parts but for tidy models we use initial split uh, and with the help of R split part of it which is yeah 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 this is like another package no this is an object so it creates an object and um this object have has information about data set testing and training um it has all that kind of information and then with prop we prepare the proportion i mean we tell the proportion like okay it will be half and half so it's just like um validation set approach we make we take half of the data for training and the other half for validation and for strata um, it helps us to make sure that both in validation and in uh, training sets we have like we don't have bias i suppose because we have like the generally the same distribution of uh, each value of selected. So we will select miles per gallon for strata for this data. And then we see that uh, like analysis SS and total. So here we have 194, 98, and then the total of the data. And we can also use testing and training uh, functions to uh, see the detail of these and in training set, maybe I will just make this part smaller. In training set, uh, we will have 194 rows and in the test set, but not test, I suppose this is the validation set. Is it correct? Am I correct? This uh, if you if you go back to the previous line of code, what is this? What does this auto test means? There's one right. So one is the training and test okay. one is the testing one. Yeah, I think you're on the mm -hmm. right. Okay, so then it means that. Okay, after this part, then we will start with the validation part. So here we just separated as train and test. So we are not making tests right now. Okay, then uh, it was also telling us that you should use the testing, 
testing data set once because otherwise you might leak the data and it might um, change your error estimations. And for linear regression in tidy models, they do uh, like they they specify some properties and yeah these are those and for the fit uh, in Bayesar we just use lm function for linear regression and um, we need to use the subsets to only take the training set not the test set and this part is normally just for Bayesar and here we just apply the specifications for tidy models and this is our um yeah this is to fit our model by using tidy models and this is the linear linear regression and then um so normally for i mean for just base r we should use a predict function to make the estimation estimations yeah just like predict and for i mean the mean is to calculate mean squared error for our validation set i mean this is 196 because uh upwards here we um separated them in a different way because we use tidy models and here uh, the proportion is given as 0 0.5 and we have a strata so it's not a it's a better validation set approach because um here we do not just directly cut the data into 100 and six and 106 instead it tries to make it uh, equal in both sets that's why the numbers are different when it tries to make the distributions equal and that's why um, the numbers are different here uh, then in Bayesar we should uh, select minus train so uh, it selects the data other than training set to calculate like predict the uh, mean squared error and in um tidy models uh, can i ask why like after the minus train is there so, a power square this is the training sets part normally in base r there's a square if we two, have a right? dash yeah, 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 square two. That's true. Also, it's a, but this is a linear model, is it? Uh, yeah. yeah, because when you predict yeah. the, the predict the test data, it can go over or under the actual value. So oh, when it oh, yeah. goes it's positive and go under is negative. So if they put a square root of two to make it both positive, okay. because we're just measuring the error. Okay, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I can. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, probably I didn't notice it. I'm sorry. That's quite a nice explanation. Thank you. Then, uh, then for tidy models, we use uh, augment to extract the prediction, and we use root mean squared error. So in Bayesar, we use mean, so it uh, estimates mean squared error but for um tidy models um it was telling like we, we would have root mean squared error then so we predicted here and so this is the testing root mean squared error and for training mean squared error we would just uh, change the data here and we see that our uh, training root mean squared error is lower 
than the testing. And it's normal, it's something expected to have a lower error than lower error in training than test. Uh, but if we see that there's a large difference between them, it might um, it might mean that it is overfit. And so normally in the Bayesian, the mean squared error of for the linear regression was twenty three point twenty seven. So when we square root it, it is like um, less than five, I suppose. Then, then we have polynomial regression. So in um, in Bayesian, here we have the quadratic and cubic regressions um, fitting parts. And then uh, for tidy models, Mm, we again use the linear model specifications unit by using re recipe and step poly. And then we make a workflow to, I mean, if we have a workflow, I suppose it's easier. Then this is just the creation of the workflow, I suppose. And then uh, here we fit the model on the training set. And so here is our workflow. No, not workflow. Uh, so this is by using the workflow, we, okay, I suppose my connection is bad. So I will just stop my video. Okay, then. Um, yeah, so we fit our model by using the training set. And then uh, we estimate the testing root mean squared error. And here it is 4.36. So normally um, in the in previous one for the linear regression, uh, we, by the way, I need to check something. Yeah, here we write degree to, this means that this is a quadratic polynomial. And if we want to calculate cubic and like higher degrees, we can just change this degree and we can observe the, I mean, we can calculate the root mean squared errors. And so uh, we can just observe like the previous one for the linear regression, our error was uh, 4.74. And now we can see that uh, polynomial regression is a better fit, but this is a quadratic polynomial regression. And, um, but still we are doing it in training set, but the important one is of course the testing part. Then uh, we can change the seed. So as we said before, if we change, I mean, if we have a seed, we can reproduce the results, but uh, different seeds can cause different training sets and different training sets can give us different error rates. And this is the a trial for that. So here I was trying to make a, um, maybe I will just show it from here because it looks a bit better. So this is the um, table that for base R, the calculations for mean squared error. So linear um, model would give us 25.73 and quadratic one is lower. And between quadratic and cubic, uh, it's not that different. And this is the uh, root mean squared because so I can compare these ones with tidy models uh, functions and uh, yeah. Just that I just took the root square roots of those. And so we can see that tidy models has a better linear fit, but still a better uh, better linear fit than base R's um, fitting, but still a quadratic one. 
is a better fit than linear model. Yes. And then I have a yeah. quick question here. Um, yes. So, and this is something, I don't know if anybody has a really good answer to this, but it's something I struggle with always with um, resampling and, and validation in particular. So, um, and I apologize if I missed this, but what we're looking at here is the test um, mean squared error and root mean squared error, right? I no, I suppose this is just training. Oh, these are just the training ones. Okay, because that I suppose so. Yeah. Oh no, test. No test. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and and that's the thing that kind of gets me because what we're sort of doing at this point is model selection, really, right? Like we're comparing the polynomial models to the regular linear regression to see which model fits the data better. And we're using the test results in order to do the model selection, but we're not using the test data for the training to actually train the models. But it sort of blurs the line for me between what, like, what, you know, whether the test data is really only being used for validation, or if it's starting to also be used for like model selection as well. Yeah, actually that was uh, what I was also got confused a little bit. That's why I was telling that. So normally we know we have the data for like auto data mm -hmm. and we separated in, into training and testing. But I was thinking that training is the training and test I mean, I was feeling like this is the validation, but I suppose I was not correct because I'm, I'm also confused about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I do see the rationale for doing it the way you have here, right? Where you're fitting the model on the training data and mm -hmm. then you're actually evaluating it with that root mean squared error on the test data so that you can get a better estimate of what that test error rate is, which is of course the thing that we really care about. <clears throat> um, but I get, it starts to feel confusing for me at least when we're like running multiple models and evaluating different test error mm -hmm. rates in order to select the model. Yes, so, um, so maybe I uh, took it wrong because I maybe the- uh, Because this, because she used the emails uh, website, the mm -hmm. first part is just telling you how to use initial split training and testing. If you read the website at the bottom part later, she'll do the, the validation part. Oh, okay. So she's yeah. not really trying so to this use part, it. Yeah, the first part is just telling you how to use the R sample package from Tidy Models to get an introduction. The later mm. part, she will start adding more functions from that same package where she will have these different kinds of validations like cross validations and leave one out. And that's where she will do all these test things that you can oh, yes. do. Yeah, so it is, I mean, <laughs> at the end, I found myself comparing uh, Bazar, like Bazar lab session in the book. And I was trying to put tidy models and I found that I was comparing those two. Was that the part that you got confused or? Uh, is it something else? Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't think it's anything you did. Is this? This is just like a sort of a perennial source of confusion for me with with validation stuff. Like, because I think there is it, there does sometimes there's like a gray area where you know you're retaining data for test, but possibly you're running multiple tests on it, um, mm -hmm. and then it's not clear if, if you're really doing validation or if you're just doing like two stages of model training. Um, but it makes better sense to me. I didn't realize that the that this was more like just sort of code demonstration to play around with these functions here. That makes better sense rather than like specifically what an analysis procedure might be for these data. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I cannot manage it very well. I mean, uh, probably I don't know what to do because I was, yeah, I don't know. At the end, I found myself, I was comparing Bazaar and Tidy Models. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know why it happened this way. Sorry for that. No, no, that's okay. This is this is very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> then then uh, maybe I can continue here. And 
Um, so yeah, uh, we can compare that a quadratic, a quadratic function is better than a linear function and a cubic function gives only a little more benefit than a quadratic function. So we can say that. So for leave one out cross validation, uh, it was said that uh, objects for leave one out cross validation, they are not generally integrated into the tidy models frameworks. So I thought I would just follow the uh, Bayesian stuff here. Then, so here's the generalized linear model and cross validation generalized linear models are used for leave or not cross validation. And if, I mean, in one of the previous chapters, we use generalized linear models with family binomial argument. But uh, if you don't use this argument, it just performs this linear model function. And this is just the proof of that. So they're identically same. And so um, GLM with the cross validation GLM function, they are the part of the boot library. And it is like, I suppose it's part of bootstrap, but I'm not sure. So, I mean, boot library might be something bigger than bootstrap. I'm not sure about it, but we will use that in bootstrap part as well. Then um, here we uh, obtain cross validation error estimation. And normally, this um, cross validation error has, yeah, it's a list with uh, several components. I mean, yeah, yeah. And um, delta has the cross validation results and we see that they are identical and um, so hmm, yeah so yeah yeah in some situations they might differ but let's continue so I suppose I'm going to continue here. And here, right now, here. Then, um, yeah, for, I mean, if we want to see the other polynomial fits, we can use a for loops. And we can, again, collect them in CV error vector, cross validation error vector. And here is one of that starting from zero to 10, like uh, one to 10. So um, this is the linear and quadratic. So we see the sharp drop here. And then, yeah, there is no clear uh, improvement for the higher order polynomials. And then for K fold cross validation, uh, again, we can use this part and from here I was not able to check the uh, tidy models parts because uh, it started to get confusing for me and also I did not have enough time again I'm sorry for my time management then so here we see that k fold cross validations uh, cross validation error rates and its computation time is of course shorter. And uh, again, cubic and higher order polynomial, polynomial terms, they will not give us uh, much more benefit than quadratic uh, function. And so the, yeah, I got confused here in this part with the delta. Um, so maybe I'm gonna just skip it because I will take your time, sorry for that. And then uh, bootstrap starts here, we will use the 
portfolio data set. And portfolio data set contains like 100 pairs of returns. So I can just show it here. It's yeah. Why can't I select? Sorry, 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 sorry. Mm, okay, it will not work. So I will not be able to show you, but there are X, um, let's say like keys and Y values, but probably they are not keys, they are like something and the other thing related to that. And then um, we try to estimate alpha. And for that, we create a function because we uh, do it like in two steps. First, we create a function, then we use boot to perform the bootstrap. So here, this is our function, alpha function. So from the data, we take x as in, yeah, like x, all of x one by one and y one by one. Then uh, I suppose this was the formula given in the chapter. And so it's like variance y minus covariance of x and y over uh, variance x plus variance y minus two multiplied by covariance, their covariance. And then um, then we use this function for portfolio data. But my um, studio session is not going well right now. So maybe I will continue here if I will have the results here. Yes. So, so this is the alpha, I suppose, because we applied this function to our portfolio data. So this is the estimation, this is our estimation, I suppose. Then um, we make a seed again, we set a seed again, and then uh, this time, we sample them like in bootstrap from 100 of our data like since we already have 100 we take 100 of them but uh, i suppose they can repeat like let's assume that we have 10 samples going one two three four five so we can take 10 of them but it can go like one 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 five five two so something like that. So, uh, and then we uh, recompute estimated alpha. I was not able to write it. So it, the estimation, I show it like this. And then um, for, yeah, I need, I will need to go back here because I suppose it ends there. I don't know why. Okay, then. Um, so the boot function makes all this thing to uh, autom like automatized, automatized. So we give the data and we give the function and so we produce like a thousand of bootstraps for alpha and and we can estimate the alpha as this and then we can uh, um estimate the standard error of 
alpha, estimated alpha, is this. Then, um, uh, then, uh, we have, so this is for linear model. I lost, I got lost. Mm. So we have like beta zero and beta one as our coefficient of the, um, like of the model, let's say, and they are uh, like intercept and slope and so for the linear regression uh, to predict miles per gallons, we use horsepower and uh, we will compare the estimates of uh, so we will compare the estimates estimates and so here we have the, I suppose these are like the, their estimations, standard error. And then, um, I suppose from this part, I am not good at to continue because I get so, um, I mean, if it would be last week, I would be, I would be better, but I suppose I got lost right now because I suppose I forgot what I have done here. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's that. fine. It's fine. I'm ashamed. No, it's fine. That's a lot. Um, that's a lot of information actually. Um, I think we can just move on because I think uh -huh. the link that you posted earlier, mm -hmm. it has yeah. the explanation in more details. Yeah, with in all the, the details in it. Yeah, maybe you can just read the book ourselves for the lab exercises. Then if that's fine, then let's move on to Jeremy for the new chapter. Before yeah. that, uh, anyone wants to take up chapter seven, that week doesn't really work for me. Because I'll be like traveling a lot that big. So, so please do consider if anyone wants to take up chapter seven. <laughs> okay, Jeremy, I think you can start. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Let's see how does this work. <laughs> Hi, can everyone see my screen? Yes, by the way, Jeremy, I'm sorry that I took your time so much. And it's thank you for right. your understanding. I, I oh tried to cut down a lot of stuff, less content, so we wrote things a bit faster. So this chapter is about regularization and model selection. And I just summarized that it's just finding alternative procedures to get better prediction accuracy and to make your models more predictable. And the book has decided to introduce three big methods, one called subset selection, one called shrinkage, and one called dimension reduction. <laughs> so the first one is the subset selection. There were three parts, but I'll just go through one of them first. It's called the best subset selection. So what it does is that it tries to fit the least square linear regression from all possible combinations of the predictors that you have and find the best one. So the first predictor is just the predictor that always says that it's the sample mean. It's called the null model. And then for k for 1 to p, it first gives all possibilities for all the first all predictors with only one and then with two and with three and so on. And then within this one, two to P, it tries to find the best using the R square. 
And then because there are case of the one to P of them, there are this amount of candidates and these candidates will be, again, be used to find which is the best one of these. So they use another criteria, which is not R square anymore, which is like, these are like the choices that they give. <laughs> And they say that they can't use R square because it keeps increasing as the number of predictors, predictors increase. Uh, but then uh, they, the book also claimed that this method is not feasible as when P gets large, your this value P choose K gets really, really large as well. So they try to cut down the number of candidate models. So they introduced this term called the forward stepwise selection, which is to add one predictor at a time. And what it does is that it always adds the predictor that gives the greatest improvement to the current model. It may not be the best one, but it's the greatest one. So it's like the same thing. They start with like the mean, the model that just keeps guessing the sample mean, and then they look at the rest of the predictors, and then they fit the predictors one at a time and then out of these like candidates it finds out which is the best and says okay this is mk plus one and then it goes back again to the second iteration but this time it only takes the one that is remaining and then it gets the mk plus becomes m2 and then uh, for these candidates we again uh, try to pick the best by using another model selection criteria. <laughs> and they introduce these methods, but the book only goes through these methods like in the later part. And then there is this uh, batwise, stepwise selection, whereby instead of starting with the now model, if it gets always the sample mean, it starts with a full model instead and then it tries to remove predictors one at a time and it removes them in such a way whereby it gives the least errors to the model when it is removed so uh, this is you start with the full model and then uh, it tries to reduce one by one uh, for each time it reduces uh, it picks the best and after uh, K iterations, you have the same number of candidates from Z to MP, and then they use the same cross-validation on these other measurement values to find out which is the best. So then the book uh, decides to go through what these things are. But this is just a graph that shows like why it works, because unlike the R square, when you compare like the number of predictors like these, alternative values like the adjusted R square, BIC or CP, it decreases as the as you add more predictors. So they go to what is the difference. So and why does it work? Because the first one is they measure this this CP value. It's the same as R square, which uses the RSS and takes the mean, but then it adds an additional penalty. And that additional penalty, well, if we look through this additional penalty that depends on this sigma, it contains the predictor. So it actually, uh, as you add the more predictors in, uh, it will give a additional penalty. And so uh, because it adds additional penalty we, and this one is also wants to be as high as, as low as possible. So because they're all measurements of error, I guess. So they prefer models that have a lower CP. Then they talk about this uh, AIC, but then they claim that for linear models with Gaussian errors, the, the AIC is the same as the CP. And that's all they go to. And then they say that the VIC is slightly similar to the these two, except that instead of this 2D, they have a log N instead. And 
they say that because of this lock and it, it gives a higher penalty. Yeah. Then this is, then they go through this adjusted R square that is it's kind of similar to R square, but it has this uh, additional, uh, this D. So because D is like the number of predictors, so when you increase the D, which is when you use more predictors, uh, this will increase this the top part. And because you increase the top part, it gets bigger and then it becomes less, less value. So because so this is that if you have more predictors, this value will get less and less, less and less. So it kind of add like also a way to penalize models that use more predictors. So this is what the book has to for these measurements. And they say that they also use the validation and cross-validation method that was discussed two weeks ago in chapter five. And I think this is all for the subset selection. And then they go through like the second part, which is to do something called a shrinkage. But the whole idea is that they want to shrink these values, these coefficients quite close to zero. Uh, how it improves, we, they didn't say the first front part. So they just introduced these two techniques. And they say they introduced something called the rich regression. So this is the same as what we've gone through the last time, but the rich regression now has this additional thing to minimize, which has this lambda, which they call it a tuning parameter because we can choose whatever values we want. And we have this coefficient square and they call this uh, a shrinkage penalty because it can only be small when this coefficient is small. And, as, and they claim that as lambda gets bigger, this will get smaller and smaller, forcing it to be close to zero. However, uh, they also mentioned that you can see that the J is, does not include the zero, so it does not include the intercept. So they say that, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, like as you increase the lambda, this coefficient starts to shrink to zero, like this, all this B will start to shrink to zero. And they also uh, advise that it is best to standardize parameters to have the same variance, then they provide this formula because as your lambda starts to increase, the beta will start to decrease. But if your predictors needs to have the same like scale so that they can be penalize equally to some sense. So it's because like, if you have a predictor that has like a lot of noise and then you have a very big beta K and then uh, as your lambda increases, your beta K, because it's very big, it will shrink to zero at a lower pace and be mistakenly identified as being useful when it's not. Then they go through this something called the lasso is because of the problems they face with which regression is that because it needs to include all the parameters and the shrinking penalty that it used to have can only shrink it close to zero but not exactly to the zero as we increase the lambda. So they the book mentioned that this is an issue if you want to find out what which predictor is the good ones because when they are close to zero, they're still being used, but we want to find out they are, whether they're good or not when it comes to zero. So what 
so without this last matter, what they actually to do is actually to if they were to use the rich regressions that they need to actually verify first by removing these uh, important variables, which can take a quite a long time if this value P is large. So to uh, so they invented this lasso method to so that this uh, computationally expensive task need not be done. So the last the lasso they mentioned that it's similar. So this is the RSS as as like the same as here. So they have this additional thing that they need to minimize as well. So instead of a square, like the rich regression, they had this like absolute value. And they claim that because of this absolute value, we can, these coefficients can shrink to become zero as the lambda gets large. And then we can actually identify those useful predictors, mainly these coefficients, predictor whose coefficient still remains. So the tuning, uh, yeah, lambda can tune to earn any values. So I, I just give this block example that I have here. So as we increase the, reg the tuning parameter, which is like our lambda, you can see that the coefficients of our predictors get string to zero. And then it soon becomes like quadratic because it used to be degree five. So this is like degree of three. And then as it increase, it becomes no more degrees left. So this is like the case whereby everyone has shrunk to zero. Then uh, the third part is that they can also use something called dimension reduction. So what it does is that it transforms the predictors from 1 to P to new predictors called, I just call it Z1 to M, where the M is less than the number of predictors. And the condition is that each of these Zs can be written in terms of all, all the predictors. So after it transforms the predictors, you will use the pre these new predictors from 1 to n to build this new regression model. That's the general idea from my understanding. <laughs> and then they also give this condition whereby because each of these ZMs can be written in terms of their predictor, so all its coefficients can be written in terms of the coefficients of its, of the transform variable. So what it's just trying to say is that the transformation is reversible. So if you transform X1 to Z1, so these, all these, all these so-called B1 from here will become this one, right? And then this one can also be written in terms of the coefficients in here. So they are like reverse. So just try to say that the transformation is reversible. You can just transfer from one term to another. <laughs> so they introduce like two, com two ways. One is by principal components and one is by partial least square. So the first part they introduced is something called like principal components, which why they they claim that they project or more like they transform the data based on the data's variation. So it's like this is like the predictor like the first one and the second one. And then they transform it in such a way whereby the green one will be like the new will be like the Z1 and the blue one will be like the Z2. So they claim that the first predictor is to minimize the sum of perpendicular distance. So what I try to say is that the first predictor is just 
drawing a line and tries to minimize the distance or these dotted lines. So all these dotted lines are the distance. So they take the square because if you are over, it's positive, and if you are under, it's negative. So they take the square to make everyone's positive. So they just try to fit these green lines such that these distance, these dotted lines, the sum, the total distance is as small as possible. And then after that, they just transform it to this way, which is like the Z1 and Z2 compared to these two original predictors, which is like the X1 and X2. <laughs> so this is the how they do it, like in terms of formulas, whereby, as I mentioned, uh, Z1 can be written in terms of its predictors. So this at bar is just the mean, but the mean, so this is actually constant. So it's just not be too dark about this. It's just trying to show that each of these Z1 can be written in terms of its predictors, pop and add. And this is just showing that how it could be how the variance is maximized by putting these conditions that these two must be, when you square them, must be equals to one. So it's like fitting some e linear equation, I guess. But, but the book did not go through like how they compute this. So uh, I think it's just trying to say that this condition must be satisfied so that uh, I guess, I guess they need to be satisfied to say that they are not related to one another. That's my guess. And then, yeah, after this, they can compute these scores. These, these scores are just transformed data. So what this Z11, Zn1 from the book mean is just these new points there. So these are like the old points, like, so, the x11, x12, and then these are the transform points like z11, z12, and so on. Then this graph is just trying to show if there's a correlation between the principal components and the predictors. And it just claims that because the first principal components is a very strong relationship between these two predictors, so they say that the first principal component is like sufficient to capture or to so summarize the information of these two predictors. That's for my that's all. And then they found the first one, which is the Z1, which is the green line. So they try to guess where Z2 is. And based on their conditions. They say that the Z2 must be perpendicular to the Z1. And since so they it's kind of false and predetermined. So they do the same thing for Z for Z2 and see if there's any strong relationship, but you can see that it's very sparse. So what it's just trying to tell you that unlike the first principal components, like Z2 don't really tell you much actually for this case. So uh, the, after that, after they transform to the principal components from the X1 to XP to Z1 to Zn, they use these new transform predictors to get, to do linear regression instead, giving you these new coefficients. So the assumption is, of course, that the, you need a small number of principal components to explain most of the variability. Like in our case, uh, Z1 is able to explain two of the predictors. And also assume that the principal components have a somehow good relationship with the response Y, which we never actually use, which again, it's not always true, unfortunately. And then it says that how this M is determined is like a tuning parameter from rich regression and lasso, whereby you need to do like cross validations and give 
different values of M to do like this tuning. And then the one that gives you the least error will be selected. And like rich regression, they advise also to standardize the predictors uh, because uh, principal components is very sensitive to high variance variables and will and high variance variables will kind of uh, overwhelm the model and make it less robust. So the weakness is that the principal components regression does not have a may not have a good response to why because we never use it. So that's where it comes up with this partial least square, which is the same thing as principal components regression, but this time it also used the information of y to transform the predictors. So like rich regression, it also requires you to standardize the predictors and then it transforms into this z1. So what it does is that it tries to get the coefficient that best predicts the y after transformation. And then uh, it will place uh, high values when we have a strong relationship, just like the principal components when we have a like in this case, when we have strong relationship, it gives a higher value, I get higher weight value. So they did it for the same example. And you can see like the green line is the PLS and the dotted line is the principal components. And it shows that the difference is not so much actually. So after it does the first direction, it needs to get the second one. And what it does is that instead of taking the whole data set, it instead sets to use the residues, residues. So this is how it ensures that the second component for the PLS is not related to the first ones because it uses information that the, it does not use information that the first ones already use. So this is just what this slide is just trying to summarize. So uh, how many partial least square method? Again, like the principal components, uh, they also use like the cross validation to, okay, two more minutes to go. I think it's a little bit more. Okay, is that they use again the one to P to, to get the lowest cross validation errors to get the same amount of principal components. So this last part is just summary of why high dimensional data is not so good. So they say that when you have high dimensional data, the test MSE will get worse and worse as you have more variables, even though your training set gets a lot better. This is what this graph is trying to say. And they say that as your dimension starts to increase, like even like lasso, like no matter how many times you do, you increase your lambda, the the level of error that you have, like the lowest MSE is still the same. <laughs> yeah, I think, so they also give other problems, like when you have high dimensional data, uh, it's also very easy to have predictors that are very, they're highly correlated to each other. So it's very hard to say which predictor is useful because they are all the saying the same thing. So they also say that even though you have like, like forward stepwise selection and you have 17 predictors, it is possible that you mean these 17 predictors may not be the same when you pick another data set. So it's also like when you have high dimensional settings, like taking the best per predictors is harder and may not be stable. I and you may need to be very careful about this. So I guess this is all with the theoretical part. And I hope I made it in time. <laughs> <laughs> you you did. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I have question about the principal analysis. I guess we can talk about it next week. Because <laughs> we are running out of time. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can post in the chat. 
I know the, I mean, the, the alpha, no, the alpha data science that chat group. Uh, yeah. Can just, yeah, then you can, I can just answer from there for if I know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, like, I try to phrase it as concise as possible. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah, then Jeremy, I guess it was so good. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the session. I guess I'll see you guys on next week. Oh, they will kick us out. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. All right. Thank see you guys you. next week. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.